As I straightened my tie, my younger brother Mark was choosing his. Mark hadn't brought a tie, but I had packed extras, so I was happy to share. We were out on the East Coast this past March, getting ready for a funeral. It was for our grandfather Pop-Pop, and I very nearly didn't go. Last minute flights are expensive, but I'm glad I did. While I was there, I asked as many of our family members as I could to tell me their favorite Pop-Pop memories. Most answers related to outdoorsy vacations, visiting national parks, camping trips, things like that. I never went on a trip like that with him, but a few months before Pop-Pop died, I went on a whitewater rafting trip with Mark, who works as a river guide. We went on the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. We had a group of six river guides and 10 adventurous tourists. Together, we covered about 90 miles over eight days. We had gorgeous views of rock formations and wildlife. We navigated challenging rapids. We went on a great many side hikes. And in a dedicated effort to leave no trace, we pooped in the metal box with a toilet seat on it, and we carried that box with us for the duration of our trip. <laughs> but the main reason I was there was to see Mark in his natural habitat. From beginning to end, it was abundantly clear that my brother truly belonged out there. It was also clear that I did not. <laughs> Early one morning, we woke up for a hike called Eminence. The night before, our trip leader got everyone together and she encouraged people who were not in great physical shape to skip the hike. I figured I'd be fine, so I went. About 15 minutes in, I was already taking breaks, gasping for air. I didn't want to push myself beyond my limits and risk hurting myself, so I said to Mark, hey, look, I'm obviously struggling. Do you think I should turn back? Mark gently encouraged me to keep going, but from then on, I was hiking by myself, going at my own pace, one small step at a time. Just before sunrise, I made it to the top. For me, it was a rigorous challenge. Mark, on the other hand, easily scampered to the top in his flip-flops. <laughs> I'm just generally not an outdoorsy person. It's not that I hate the outdoors. I just love writing screenplays to an extent that is extreme. I have lived here in sunny California for a decade, and I did not own a decent pair of sunglasses before this trip. I bought sunglasses specifically for this trip, because until then, I hadn't really needed good sunglasses. That's how rarely I go outside. <laughs> That's how much I love writing screenplays. And by the way, I was missing more than just sunglasses. Before we set out, Mark provided me with hiking boots, a life jacket, a camping backpack, a headlamp, and two water bottles, which I used for whiskey. And then, in the middle of our trip, when my delicate little baby hands were developing blisters because of all the paddling, Mark gave me his gloves. At the end of our trip, we hiked out on the Bright Angel Trail from the river to the rim. Up at the top, one of the transportation coordinators came up to me and said, hey, you're Mark's brother, right? Yeah, that's me. She'd been on trips with Mark back when she was a kid. With a big grin, she told me, your brother taught me how to paddle. I laughed and said, oh, wow, that's awesome. He did the same for me. <laughs> I gotta say, I do regret not telling Pop-Pop about this river trip. What makes my regret even worse is the fact that I tried and failed. Immediately after we got back, I emailed Pop-Pop a picture of me and Mark from our trip. In the image, Mark is pointing at my shirt because the shirt I'm wearing is from one of our family reunions. It's bright yellow, and on the front, it has a faded purple picture of our grandparents, Mom Mom and Pop-Pop. By sending the picture, I was trying to let Pop-Pop know that I was thinking about him and that I cared about him because I knew he didn't have a lot of time left but he never responded to my email, so I have a feeling he never saw it. I know he would have enjoyed seeing the picture and learning about our trip. He would have laughed at me for being so far outside my element, and he would have praised Mark for being so great at his job. But I think his favorite part by far would have been hearing the story of our flip. Going into our trip, Mark had never flipped a boat before, but he always knew a flip was inevitable. Even the most experienced guides make mistakes. On day seven of our trip, the guides hammered stakes into the ground, tying up their boats as passengers stepped out onto the narrow beach. We made our way along the dirt path, 
up to the overlook. We were scouting a rapid called Hans. It was the largest, most dangerous rapid on our trip. I've never heard a guide confess this, so maybe I'm completely wrong, but I suspect that there are certain rapids along the river that scare them. River guides always seem super confident, but the truth is they're not always in control. Just a couple months ago, Mark told me a story about a guide who fell off his boat in a rapid and got pulled underwater by the current with such force that he touched river bottom. He made it back up to the surface, took a breath, and then again he was pulled down, and again he touched river bottom. To put that in perspective, within the canyon, the average depth of the river is about 40 feet, and this guy was wearing a life jacket. The guides all know where things like that are possible. So I find it very telling that Hans was the only rapid on our entire trip that the guides decided to scout. All forward, yelled Mark. We started paddling, striving for good quality strokes in perfect harmony. Mark was perched on the back of the boat, using his paddle to steer us in the right direction. At this point, I was feeling really confident. We'd been through so many rapids already that it felt like we could handle anything. So I was itching for a fight. <laughs> Mark told me later that in this moment, he was feeling nervous. We entered Hans on the right side of the river to avoid the rocks, and then we started making a hard cut over to the left side to avoid getting thrashed around by a murderer's row of massive waves. Making that hard cut would come down to whether or not we could paddle effectively, which is maybe why Mark was so nervous. I'm not a good paddler. Even on the best of days, my arms are flimsy pool noodles, and at this point in the trip, I was just straight up exhausted. But I didn't want to let the team down, so I pushed myself with my arms burning to keep going. In the end, we made the cut. For us, Hans was a breeze, and that was because we successfully avoided all of its most dangerous features. When we made it to calmer waters, Mark called out for a celebratory paddle high five. As we gingerly touched the tips of our paddles together, we cheered with immense relief and a sense of accomplishment because we had just conquered the toughest rapid on our trip with a textbook perfect run. I can clearly hear Pop-Pop's voice in my head. That's not a story about a flip. What gives? No, Pop-Pop. We did not flip at Hans. We became overconfident at Hans. And then, two miles later, we flipped at Sockdolager. <laughs> that was the second biggest rapid on our trip. Before going into Sock Dollager, Mark told us we only needed to worry about the beginning where there are two gigantic waves. We had the option to play it safe and avoid one of the waves, but morale was high, so we decided to go big. <laughs> when we hit that first wave, it felt like our boat had been smacked by a brick wall. I was dazed. It was the hardest hit we'd taken all trip. But then I remembered I was supposed to be paddling, so I leaned forward and lunged at the water just in time to get smacked again. Our boat tipped up on its side. I started sliding down. I tried reaching for a strap, a rope, something, anything to stop myself from falling. But within a fraction of a second, I realized we were not coming back from this, and that was it. I crashed headfirst into the cold water, and I lost my sunglasses. <laughs> I guess some things just aren't meant to be. The boat came down on top of me, so I couldn't surface for air. I shuffled my hands along what used to be the top of the boat and found my way out pretty quickly. I popped out right next to the boat, grabbed a rope, and rowed out the rapids. Meanwhile, Mark got thrown from the boat, so he ended up some ways away. But even so, in the middle of these dangerous rapids, he still managed to swim back to our upside-down paddle boat, climb on top of it, and pull two swimmers up there with him. Obviously, we weren't trying to flip, but now, looking back, I wouldn't have it any other way. The older brother in me will be forever thrilled that when Mark flipped for the first time, I was right there in the water with him. Later, I learned that our boat actually had a chance to slam back down without flipping. Basically, when the boat tipped up on its side, the guy in front of me grabbed a rope that he was not supposed to grab in an effort to keep himself in place, and he ended up pulling the boat past the point of no return. River guides have a fun little nickname for this type of maneuver. 
closing the coffin. <laughs> this is because when someone causes a boat to flip in this specific way, it looks like they're closing the lid of their own coffin. I associate this phrase with our flip, but of course it also brings to mind an image of Pop Pop. We did not lose Pop Pop suddenly. We knew a few months before the trip that his condition was getting worse, and he didn't die until a few months after we got back. So after I emailed him that picture, I had plenty of time to follow up with him, but I didn't. Instead, I got laser focused on my latest screenplay, so the idea of following up never even crossed my mind. Making time for other people is not something that comes naturally to me. What does come very naturally to me is closing myself in a box that is cramped and dark. As much as I love it, I must admit, I spend an unhealthy amount of time in my studio apartment working on screenplays and other creative projects. Creativity is, for me, what rafting is for Mark. We both get sucked into our passions sometimes for eight months straight. And when we get in our respective flows, it's nearly impossible to get a hold of us. Initially, I did not want to go to Pop Pop's funeral. I told my parents it was because the last minute flights were too expensive, but the truth was way more horrifying and selfish. I had a lot of momentum on the creative project I was working on, and I wanted to keep that going. I thought stepping aside for a couple of days to go to my grandfather's funeral might disrupt my creative flow. I had the exact same concern before my trip with Mark. Ultimately, I chose to go on the river and I chose to go to the funeral because I actually do understand that other people are far more important than whatever I happen to be working on at any given time. The problem is that this is something that I have to make a conscious choice to remember. I feel like I didn't make that choice with Pop Pop, especially with regards to the picture. But I know I've been making it with Mark, which is something I actually see clearly in that very same picture. And then every so often, I'll hear something that just generally makes me feel more hopeful. When I arrived at the funeral home for Pop Pop's wake, I went to where my mom was sitting, and after we hugged, she said, I knew all along that you were going to be here because you've always been so sweet and caring. Moments like that make me wonder if I am excessively magnifying my failures. And I think that maybe, just maybe, even though it usually doesn't feel like it, it is possible that I am actually doing a lot of things correctly. Thank you. <laughs> Jeff Allen, ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Allen.